I'm Suzanne Wilson. I was on the Board of Supervisors from 1978 to 1990, uh, January of 1991. And the reason that I went to the Board of Supervisors, I have to go back first to 1973. In 1973, I was very involved in the community and I, I had become very involved in women's issues and issues of rights from minorities and equal rights for women. So that when an opening came on the city council in 73, I ran. I was an unknown, an underdog. There were 20 in the race. And I had the audacity to say that I wanted to create a level playing field for women and minorities. And people, particularly the people who were involved in the council, it was a citywide election, uh, couldn't believe what I was saying. And also, one of my platforms was I wanted to create the, a park on the Guadalupe River. It only took you know, uh, three decades to get that one accomplished, but it was finally, it finally is reality today. And I remember I ran on the platform of being concerned, competent, and compassionate. And somehow or another, I won that race. And I became a change agent on the city council. I was really very involved in the social issues and the and the council, of course, had a lot of land use and a lot of police and fire. And I was interested in social issues, so that's why I became interested in the Board of Supervisors. Because the board really has the heart of the county in terms of meeting the people's needs. And I wanted to be a part of that, that board so that I could help create more change. Although I'd already created some change on the city council. So, I was considered a shoe in I got reelected to the San Jose City Council and in 1978. I was the vice mayor of San Jose and there was nobody going to run against me. And then something happened. And the City Council had on their agenda a proclamation. We gave proclamations to everyone to have a gay pride day in St. James Park. And the the Scottish Christian Church came unglued. Uh, there were 400 people stormed the council chambers and 200 more in the cafeteria. And they protested that this was a horrible thing to do and a terrible thing and socially it would be awful for the people and we should not pass that resolution. We declared it was the rights of everybody to have resolution. There was no criteria. We gave resolutions to ordinary organizations in the community and they were an organization and it passed on a three to on a, a four to three vote one of those on that uh, fork side put it back on the agenda the following week and we had an 800 people there and they protested and they protested and my stance then was they had a constitutional right to be able to have their gay pride day in the park. And there was nothing wrong with the, the constitutional rights of theirs and it should not be denied. The board, the city council rescinded that vote and on a five to two, they threw out the resolution, the proclamation. Jim Self and myself were the two that said no, we would not rescind that. And so, I turned on that day, which was in February, three weeks before filing date, and instead of being a shoe in, there were 16 in the race, and I almost lost in the primary. It was a vote came down 22 and a half percent for me, and 21 percent for a guy named Ivan Zubel. And so that my I had a very rocky beginning in my career going toward the Board of Supervisors. Fortunately, there was another issue that came up in the summertime. The four of the council members called the fearsome foursome uh, fired the city manager who was very popular in San Jose. And doors that had slammed for me in March and April and May opened and the first thing they'd say to me, are you part of the fearsome foursome? And I would smile and say, no ma'am, I am not. I voted to retain Ted Tedesco as our city manager, and I won. Just like that, my career can be changed just on one issue. One issue 
turned me down, one issue helped me win. And that was the year then I ran in 1978 for the board and Prop 13 was on that. And I was, uh, at that point, there were, uh, it was just a, that same election where I was winning and I was going out campaigning against Prop 13 and the county was overwhelming me for Prop 13. But I won because I had fierce force <laughs> to, to contend with and they forgot about my stand on Prop 13. But the, the gay pride, uh, and I think the, the rights of individuals in this community has always been one of my hallmarks, you might say. And so that the rights of gay, lesbians, bisexuals in this community has always been a part of my platform, really, and on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we had, at, at times, there were difficult things that came up. We had a, 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 we put on a measure to give rights to gays in this community, and it passed countywide. And then the opposition came unglued and got it rescinded the next election. And then the AIDS crisis came. And I was the chair of the board when the AIDS crisis came in this county and in San Francisco, in the United States. And we were the first county that opened the hospital doors uh, for, the, for medication and for assistance to the gay community during that time. And then later, I established a, a commission, a special task force, to see what we could do to assist those victims of AIDS in our community. In fact, Ken Yeager, who is now a supervisor, was the chair of that uh, commission that, or, or task force that we did. And the board passed unanimously the recommendations that we had of how we could assist those who were, uh, had AIDS and who ha we were going to help survive. And indeed, we've turned around a lot in this county. And yet the battle's not over as far as uh, bringing independence and equal rights to the gays. Another of the issues that I fought very stridently was domestic violence and rape crisis and the things that happened to women and children in this city, in this county. And so that I helped establish the, the Domestic Violence Council with Lynn Edwards, who was an outstanding juvenile judge in this county. And so that council is still going on today, and I'm very proud of that fact. A lot of things have happened in this county. I can remember when I first ran for election, uh, there were two people, uh, Janet Gray Hayes and myself on the council. And we were the only women elected in this county at the time that was any, any significant size of the city. And so that by the time that uh, the 80s came along, we were called the feminist capital of the world because we had so many women involved in politics. And I helped establish the National Women's Committee, uh, the National Committee for uh, Political Action for Women. I helped establish the National Women's Political Caucus in this valley. And we were very strong. And so that's one reason that uh, women became leaders in this valley because other women were always helping them. And I always took pride in, the, in watching other women achieve, which I think is sometimes different than other politicians. I really celebrated other women when they were elected to office. And it, it made me proud to be a part of them. And, this, and the Board of Supervisors became uh, a, the majority of a board when I was on the council. First, Jerry Steinberg was on the, on the board when I was on the board when I came on the board, and then Diane McKenna, Zoe Lofgren, and I constituted a majority of women on that council, on that board of supervisors. And I can remember when we were selecting a new county executive, the first one in a long time, and there were five candidates for it. We narrowed them down to two. And a reporter said to me one day, well, Susie, I guess I know who you're going to appoint for the county executive. And I said, oh, do you? And he, I said, who? He said, well, you're going to have to choose the man. And I said, why would I have to do that? And he said, well, because how would it look if three women chose a woman? And I looked him in the eye and I said, well, 
I guess it would look just like how about for 100 years, five men chose a man. And he looked at me and I laughed and we went on about our business. He didn't bother to write that story <laughs> about how, we, and indeed we did choose a woman. We chose Sally Reed, which was the, she was the first woman county executive uh, in a large city or a large county uh, in the nation. And she was a very effective uh, administrator. We went through some difficult times. And I guess one of the hardest things that I ever did was when I was the chair of the board in 1982. And we had to lay off a thousand people. And we sat there in those board chambers almost with tears in our eyes and the tears with the eyes in the eyes of people who were watchers of the county board when we had to decrease the services to the disabled and decrease the services to the, the uh, alcoholics who we were trying to help. And it was a tough time. So when I've looked in, in, and seen cities and counties that said, well, we're gonna have to lay off 200 people. We're gonna have to lay off 500 people. I wanna say, you don't know what it's like to really lay off people who are trying to help other people. We laid off a thousand people and it was a terrible thing to go through, but we built back up. We, we were also conservative in the way that we spent our money, so we were able to add back as we went along. I always said that I was a flaming liberal feminist, but I was always a conservative with my money. I never spent a penny I didn't have, either in my home or with the county. We had to balance our budget and do a good job of it so we could provide the services to people. We got in some tough times. Our jail was overcrowded and it was under court order to build a new jail. And so we finally got the plan. We got the money from the feds and the states, got enough money to put together bonds to build a new jail. And we started building it. Well, it was, uh, we had a, an oversight who said we weren't building it fast enough and finally the Superior Court, who was part of that oversight, called us together and demanded that we build geodesic domes out at the jail farm because we weren't building the jail fast enough. And I said to them, and we said to them, you're crazy, we can't do that. By the time we got the EIR finished for those geodesic domes, the new jail would be completed and we're not gonna do it. It's a, foolish waste of money. So we said no. We said no to Judge Avakian, a, who was <laughs> a very strict uh, autocratic kind of judge, who said, fine, I, found, I find you in contempt of court. And he tried to send us to jail. This was in 1986. And that year we made the national headlines of the four of us marching out of the courtroom, headed for jail, they thought. So we appealed, and he lost at the appeal. And so it went on to the state Supreme Court. Because I was a supervisor for District 1, uh, I now have at the Supreme Court a, a, a case called Wilson versus the Superior Court, and we won. So we did not go to jail. And guess what? the jail got built and finished. And it's now standing today and it's still <laughs> overcrowded and the jail farm is still overcrowded. So not much changes. Things go around and come back again and again. So that's, that's part of it. One of the, I guess another interest of mine was uh, environmental issues and the parks at, at our county. I was very, I had more parks in my district than any. I was District 1, and it was the best district in the county, really. And there were more parks in my district, but also there were more con environmental concerns. And when IBM had a, a leakage in their tanks that were placed uh, underground because they wanted the, uh, uh, the, not to be unsightly, it was unsightly to have tanks above ground. And so all the planning committees, the commissions in the county, and the county itself, ordered that all the tanks be placed underground. 
And so, of course, they didn't last, and IBM had a plume of contaminants that leaked into the water table. And that created a great environmental disaster for us in this county. So I created uh, a, what we called the Safe Water Council. And there, on that council, we had IBM, we had other industrial giants, we had the environmentalists, we had environmental attorneys, we had the water district people. So we pulled together a committee called the Safe Water Council. And through that committee, we created ordinance on how to handle uh, disasters when they come. And it's called the Underground Water Tank, Underground Tank Ordinance, which said you can no longer put tanks underground. And with the fire departments in this county, we created an ordinance that was a model ordinance of how you would put the tanks above ground, how that they had to have a certain uh, safety features so that we would not uh, have any more contamination. And then also, and that ordinance, after we, we did it as a model ordinance, we took to the, went to the state and the state adopted it. And so today in California, we have all of our tanks for all the chemicals that we use in Silicon Valley and throughout California have to be above ground and they have to be safeguarded. And we did that in this county and I'm proud of that. I'm very proud of the fact that we were able to do that. Another issue that was so important to me was the hospital. When I first came on the, the board, I was appointed as, a, as the chair of the Joint Conference Committee, which was the committee that ran the hospital, doctors and all the staff of the hospital, but then the supervisor that was on the, the chair of that committee was the person who brought to the board all the issues that the hospital wanted passed and try to get them through the hospital, through the board of supervisors on a vote that would be effective to help change the hospital. The hospital was in a shambles financially in 1979. It had not been audited in three years. And I also became the chair of the audit committee. And so I knew the, the state it was in, the reputation was terrible. We started a rebuilding process with the, health, uh, with the hospital. The county executive found a new uh, administrator, a guy named Bob Sillen, who became a giant in this county. And he, he started creating programs at the hospital and emphasizing programs at the hospital so that it turned itself around. In, in another two years' time, the hospital not only was audited, but it began to do the things it was supposed to do in an efficient way, as economically as possible. Because, of course, the county hospital has, has to provide medical care to anyone who walks in the doors. It's called an open door policy. We turn nobody down. And so you can imagine today in this times that we are still the safety net in, uh, for people who cannot afford health care, who have no insurance at all. And we're the only hospital in this county that does that. And we have grown to the point that Two, two, two elections ago, the voters of this valley voted $850 million worth of bonds to continue to improve that hospital. And it didn't receive a 66 and two thirds vote. It received a 74% vote. The largest uh, you can imagine for a county hospital that, uh, that 35 years ago was called a disaster. So I'm kind of proud about that. In fact, I still serve that hospital because I'm on the VMC Foundation. And what we do is we, we go out and find money for those things the hospital cannot do for themselves. And we create programs that uh, buy things like a CAT scan for the cancer center with the help of the wonderful philanthropists in this valley. So we're still doing good at that hospital. And I that's, that's something I continue to be proud of. And people uh, have sometimes said, Susie, uh, what did you like about your job? And I always say, well, it was the people. I was there to serve the people of this county. And, and I hope I did well. And I think I did because I have a lot of friends that I've made through these years that are continue to be my friends. 
And one of the things that they knew is they could depend on me that my word was good. If I said I was going to do something, I wasn't somebody that would change my mind because some three other people had talked to me. I felt I knew what was the right thing to do, and I'd go ahead and vote whether I won or lost. That was immaterial. The point was that I had to know at the end of the day that I'd stayed true to my core beliefs. And so with that kind of philosophy, as a flaming liberal, I had many, many Republicans because I was also that very cautious fiscal person that helped support me all through the years. And, and, you, and I could say some of my best friends are the millionaires in this valley. And we still debate some of the issues that we have as we talk about women and children and minorities and trying to level the playing field because it's not level yet. But we still work on it and we'll get there. I became a mentor perhaps for people who wanted to, women who wanted to run for political office. And the doors of my office have always been open, still to this day, for young women who are interested in changing the world, because that's what we set out to do. When you become an elected official, you have, you have causes inside of you, and you have beliefs that you think you can do some good for the people, but you've got to work for it. I don't think I'm giving back to the community. I'm working as hard as I can to help the community when there's a difference because it's not that the community's been good to me and I need to give back. I just need to work as hard as I can to make this a better community for every the people, for everybody who lives here. So in turn, it's my job to encourage other people to run for office. I was always proud to be a politician. I think it's an honorable profession. And you, when you're working in it, you meet wonderful people who are also very honorable. But the most important people you meet are the people that you serve. And if you can serve people and at the end of the day be happy with what you've done, I think you've gained the world.